It was a sunny Saturday afternoon when John finished his errands in town and began the drive back home. He had just gone to the hardware store to pick up some supplies for the deck repairs he planned to start that weekend. As he drove down the familiar forest road that wound through the trees leading to his remote cabin, John began to feel uneasy. He couldn't quite put his finger on it, but something felt off. The forest seemed unnaturally still and quiet. No birds sang in the trees or squirrels darted across the road like usual. John started to drive a little faster, eager to get back to the safety of his home. That's when he rounded a bend in the road and slammed on the brakes. In the middle of the road sat an old pickup truck, its hood raised. A man stood peering into the engine compartment. John pulled up behind and got out to offer assistance. Everything okay, he called out. The man turned, and John was startled by his appearance. His face was deathly pale, and his eyes looked hollow, sunken in with dark rings beneath them. My truck just died on me out of nowhere, the man croaked. His voice sounded weak and raspy. I can't for the life of me figure out what's wrong. John walked up and took a look for himself, but saw nothing amiss. The engine looked fine as far as he could tell. Maybe it just needs a jump start, John suggested. He went to fetch cables from his Jeep, but when he returned, the man and his truck were gone. John scanned the road in both directions, but saw no sign of either. It was as if they had vanished into thin air. A chill ran down his spine as the unsettling feeling from before returned stronger than ever. He got into his Jeep and stepped on the gas, eager now to get home as fast as possible. But when John arrived at his cabin, things only grew more strange. His front door was wide open, swinging gently in the breeze. John never left it unlocked, let alone open while away. He slowly exited his Jeep, senses on high alert, and grabbed an old baseball bat from the back just in case. Hello, he called out cautiously as he entered. The cabin appeared otherwise undisturbed, but someone or something had clearly been inside during his absence. John did a thorough search but found no intruder. Whoever or whatever was here was now gone. He noticed the small details that seemed off though, like cabinets left slightly ajar in the kitchen and a pillow out of place on the couch. John shivered as he grabbed his phone to call the local police. But before he could dial, the battery died. Perfect timing, John grumbled as he went to plug it into charge. Except his phone charger was missing, unplugged from its usual spot. John began to worry that his mysterious visitor might return and he'd be defenseless without a working phone. Night was falling fast too. He locked up the cabin and decided to sleep in his Jeep, parked right outside the front door with his shotgun on the passenger seat, just in case. John barely slept a wink that night, jolting awake at every little noise. As daylight broke, he saw that his cabin and the immediate area around it appeared undisturbed. Slowly, his nerves began to settle, and the uneasiness began fading into the light of a new day. John fixed himself some breakfast, deciding to attribute yesterday's strange events to his overactive imagination playing tricks in the creepy forest. He spent the morning working on repairs to his deck as a means to distract himself and feel in control again. By lunchtime, John's unease had vanished, replaced by pride in his accomplishments. But as he went inside to grab a bottle of water from the fridge, a blinking light on the answering machine caught his eye. One new message. John pressed play and was shocked to hear the voice of his friend Ben. Hey John, it's Ben. Just touching base because we were supposed to meet for a hike at the trailheads this morning and you never showed. Got worried when you weren't answering your phone either. Give me a call when you get this to let me know you're okay. All right, John froze, confused. He hadn't made plans to hike with Ben. In fact, he'd been home alone all weekend so far. He listened to the timestamp on the message. It was from that very morning. Shaken, John sat down at the kitchen table, trying to piece together what was happening. Did he have some kind of lapse in memory? Was that why he didn't recall planning to meet Ben? He pulled out his phone, hoping it had regained enough charge by now to make a call. But the moment John turned it on, he was greeted with a dead battery symbol. No, he muttered in disbelief. It shouldn't have died that quickly. A feeling of dread began rising in his chest once more as thoughts of the man by the broken down truck, the missing phone charger, and that cryptic voicemail swirled in his mind. Someone or something was clearly messing with him, erasing or manipulating events. But to what end? John decided he needed help and fast. He grabbed his shotgun again and raced out the front door, 
sprinting towards the neighbor's house a mile down the road as fast as he could. When John pounded on their door frantically, George and Martha appeared puzzled to see him so distraught. Son, what in tarnations got you all riled up? George asked as John struggled to catch his breath and explain. But when he recounted the strange events of the past day, George just stared at him like he had lost his mind. And as a fiddle. Are you feeling all right? You were just here yesterday evening and seemed fine as a fiddle. Didn't say nothing about no strange visitors. A sick feeling twisted John's stomach into knots. He knew George was telling the truth. The old farmer wouldn't lie or play games with him. But somehow, the neighbor didn't recall the same things John was experiencing. Maybe he really was losing his mind after all. Martha saw the panic in John's eyes and took pity. Why don't you stay here for a bit? Rest up. I'll fix you some tea to calm your nerves. But John refused, insisting he needed to return home and sort this out for himself. Though frightened, he needed answers. As he hurried back down the trail, peering warily into the ominous shadows of the encroaching forest, John started to doubt everything he thought he knew. Had any of the past events truly occurred what day even was it anymore by the time his little cabin came into view, John's nerves were shot. He slowly entered, shotgun drawn, ready to confront whatever entity was messing with his reality and his mind. But inside, all was eerily normal and undisturbed once more. John scoured every inch but found not a single trace that anything had been amiss. He sank to the floor, clutching his head in his hands as tears of fear and frustration rolled down his cheeks. Please, just make it stop. John begged to the empty room. That's when he heard a noise coming from the bedroom and his blood ran cold. Holding his breath, John crept over and pressed his ear to the door, hearing shuffling and rustling from within. With a burst of adrenaline, he kicked the door open and aimed his shotgun, ready for anything. But the room was deserted, looking exactly as he had left it that morning. Except on the bed, neatly folded, sat a stack of clothes that were definitely not his. John walked over slowly and unfolded the top layer. It was a plaid flannel shirt, far too big for his frame. As he held it up, a photo fell out of the pocket and fluttered to the floor. With a shaking hand, John picked it up and gasped, frozen in shock and horror. Staring back at him from the photo was the pale, gaunt face of the man from the broken-down truck. Except he was dressed normally and smiling, with his arm around another man who John instantly recognized with dread. It was himself, also grinning happily. But John had never seen this photo before or been to the place it was taken. Stamped on the back was a date from nearly a decade ago. A blood-curdling howl suddenly erupted from the forest right outside, jerking John from his terrified stupor. He bolted from the cabin and scrambled back into his jeep, refusing to look back even once as he stomped the gas and fishtailed furiously down the winding forest road, praying to escape this nightmarish place for good. When John burst through the front door of George and Martha's house, nearly collapsed from exhaustion and panic, their shocked expressions told him all he needed to know. It's still happening, ain't it, boy, George said grimly. John could only nod weakly. Best you get comfortable then. Looks like you're stuck in this loop with that thing until it decides to let you go. If it ever does. John broke down sobbing as Martha held him, but they both knew the kind old farmer spoke the awful truth. Who or what was tormenting John in these woods? And to what end he may never find the answers? All John could do was pray it didn't. 